So this is our update and Q&A session. So this is your chance to um, ask questions of our policy experts. And I'm going to introduce Cynthia Hammond, who's from PII, which is Policy Liaison and Implementation, <laughs> PLI. PLI. Sorry, it's been a long day. And Greg Martin is from OPE, and I know that y those of you who come every year, you know both of them. Greg Martin, Office of Post-Secondary. So all those difficult questions, <laughs> apparently it's Greg. Right. So um, please, uh, we're going to run around with mics again. So any questions once they start, please let us know. Thank you, Marcia, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, I know getting here isn't always easy, so wherever you came from, uh, congratulations on having made it. Um, <laughs> so it looks like it's pretty nice, and the, the mountains are real pretty, so hopefully we'll have a, a good week here. Uh, so uh, last we talked, I think last year we were uh, about to embark on some negotiated rulemaking that affects you. And I will talk a little bit about that. I, I want to talk about some other guidance that we have out there that I think is also, uh, it was not intended uh, specifically for foreign schools, but it certainly does affect you and, and how you administer aid. And that is an electronic announcement that we put out in November, on November 5th specifically. And it changed our longstanding guidance on what we consider to be standard terms, uh, standard term lengths, and it, I would say it's a liberalization of, uh, of the guidance we've had uh, for many, many years. So I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but I would certainly hope you would take a look at it. It's, on, it's out on IFAP. Um, you can access it under electronic announcements. And it's, in a, it's a November 5th electronic announcement. It's fairly detailed. There are two parts of it. The first one is a cover letter, which explains it's, it's like an overview of what we intended to do. And then there is a an attachment to that that goes into great detail about what we have done with respect to standard terms, some of the uh, uh, enhancements or latitude that we've that we've allowed, and so what flexibility. we flexibility. Thank you. The flexibilities we've allowed uh, that we haven't in the past, and we were able to do this guidance because although the regulations reference standard terms all the time. They, they reference semesters, trimesters, and quarters. Nowhere in regulation is, it, is the standard term defined, and it, no, neither is it defined in, um, in statute. So the definitions that we always use were, were guidance. They went back a long time, but it was guidance. So since it was guidance that we had, we could change it. And f previously, we were, we were uh, uh, pretty uh, in inflexible about the definition of a standard term, which was, uh, for semesters anyway, uh, generally 15 to 17 weeks, sometimes 14 to 17 weeks. Uh, uh, we have uh, liberalized that quite a bit. So for instance, now a semester can be anywhere from 14 to 21 weeks. So I think that we did a lot of good work there. I'm pretty proud of what we did. Uh, we were able to, to give people a lot more flexibility, and I don't think uh, that we compromised the prog program integrity in any way uh, at all. So we kind of moved into the 21st century, I met schools where they are now, and I think that uh, uh, if you read that, you'll, you'll find um, uh, that it gives you uh, some opportunities to maybe do more with your programs than you've done in the past. So I would, uh, I would if you haven't looked at that, that I almost said Dear Colleague Letter, and I, I can't say that word, uh, electronic <laughs> announcement, you will find uh, that, that I think it's a fairly uh, substantive uh, thing that we've done. And I believe they're going to hear from... Uh, Byron tomorrow on this topic as well. Right. Byron is going to go into great detail on term lengths and whatnot, so uh, you can ask him any questions you have about it. No doubt he studied that document in depth and has found it to be <laughs> an amazing piece of policy guidance, and he'll enlighten you on that tomorrow. Yes, best ever. I knew he'd say that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, th so that. And um, we're expecting some guidance to come out soon. Uh, involving uh, foreign medical schools and uh, uh, elective clinical periods. So I'll, that, that should be coming out, we hope, in the next month or so. That, too, will be an electronic announcement. That, too, will be only of interest to foreign medical schools. So um, I'll leave you to anticipate that. It's a good thing to wish for for the holiday season, so we'll, <laughs> I'll leave that out there. No doubt what you've been waiting for 
or wishing for all year. Uh, so those two things. Um, on the regulatory front, we did uh, a series of negotiated rulemakings last which, January through April, I believe it was. And uh, there were some foreign schools issues uh, that, well, perhaps weren't first on the table, but they let's just say they came up. So uh, we were able to do a couple of things with respect to foreign schools uh, with these regulations. Probably not everything you would have hoped for, but certainly a, uh, I think a step in the right direction. Uh, and you know, as, as all of you are aware, we're, we're sort of hamstrung when it comes to issues of distance education. And I know that our rules on distance education are um, uh, very strict, very rigid, and that's because the, the, uh, the uh, statute requires us to be strict about that. Simply doesn't give you any latitude for distance education at all. Um, I, I personally hope that in the future, uh, maybe there'll be uh, some, uh, some legislation which might make that a little more uh, open, you know, I'm not, and, and maybe uh, uh, something that would allow at least some distance education, but right now we don't have that. So what we did with these regulations was look at what we could do through uh, just regulatory activity. And we had f four negotiating sessions. We had these, we had these uh, a main table and we had subcommittees for the first time. And the subcommittee that I was on uh, dealt a little bit with, uh, with, the, uh, with foreign school uh, issues. Uh, the first thing I think, uh, and I, I wanna point out that we don't have a, when we do these um, negotiated rulemakings, there are two possibilities. One is that we don't reach consensus. So we have a group, we have the federal negotiator and we have a group of negotiators who represent various parts of the community, financial aid community. And our, and our goal is always to reach consensus. Um, sometimes we reach it, sometimes we don't. But this time around, we, we did reach consensus. So we have what we would call a mandatory text, which is uh, the way the regulation uh, Will uh, would look if that text became actual regulation. And we did reach consensus, so the mandatory text is what will be in the, in the notice of proposed rulemaking when the notice of proposed rulemaking goes out. Now, we have not issued the notice of proposed rulemaking yet, but the language is out there. So if you want to go on um, the ed. just ed.gov website, it's ed.gov, if you go in there, the easiest way to do it is just to type in the search box, negotiated rulemaking, it will bring up the 2018 negotiated rulemaking, and then you can go to the bottom of that, scroll down, and you can get the mandatory text under uh, part 600. It will show you what the text will look like. And you really want to look at 600.52 and point fifty four for those um, for those changes. And I'll just briefly say what we've, and again, I have to preface this by saying none of this is um, in an NPRM yet, so it's, not only is it not regulation, it's not even proposed, but I can talk about it because we did reach consensus. So one of the things that we looked at was uh, the, uh, as you are aware, the, the current prohibition on, uh, on, your, on American students attending your institutions coming over here at, for any reason to do any, anything in the United States, right? Except for that one little provision that allows a doctoral student who's working on the dissertation part of uh, his, in the dissertation phase of his or her um, of his or her PhD program to come over here, and then there's that if it, if it's research that can only be done in the United States and only for a year. So that's very limited, right? So we have put in these um, can't say proposed in this mandatory text uh, to allow um, students that would be any undergrad, any students to come over here for. Uh, for um, no more than 25% of a program to an, um, to an institution, an eligible institution in the United States. So, you know, thank you. And, and, and I, you know, people to thank for this, I think uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna give a shout out to Harrison uh, Wadsworth who uh, brought this issue up. I mean, not that I wasn't aware of it, but you know, Harrison, Harrison certainly was an advocate for you in that regard. And, um, and also my, uh, our acting undersecretary, Diane Jones, who uh, was very gracious in, in 
listening to what we had to say, because originally these topics weren't on the table, you know, but saying, well, can we do these things? Can we open this up a little bit more than we have and put these issues out there and take them to the table? Uh, because we don't think there'll be any opposition to any of it, and, and there wasn't. Uh, when it came to the main table, th there was a lot of agreement about doing this. So, you know, maybe not as much as you want, but something. So it allows American students to come back. Th there could be any number of reasons why they want to come back. Uh, and I want to I say that when, these, when this proposed rule goes out, you'll see that you'll, the two aspects of it. The first part will be a preamble discussion of what we did. So you want to read that and you want to read the rule, and you have an opportunity to comment. Because as I said, we have this amendatory text, which is agreed upon text, consensus was reached. In the NPRM, we are, we are bound to put that out there as the proposed rule. However, there is a comment period. So there are some things that you should think about, you know, um, the aspect, the relationship of that 25% amount of time to the, uh, to the uh, one year period of time that you have for dissertations and what the relationship of those two will be. Uh, read it carefully. I, I, can't, I can't prejudice any of the negotiations by saying where we're going with it or, or anything like that, but I can say that that's what's, that's what's in the amendatory text. You need to read it. Anything that confuses you, uh, please Ask. comment, right? If it confuses you, please comment. If you have a better way, something you think would be better, please comment. Um, so. Uh, that's your opportunity to comment. So I hear a lot of people, regs become final, and they'll say, but this wasn't there, and that wasn't there, and they didn't consider this. Uh, we're not omnipotent. I can't consider everything, or omniscient, I should say. Certainly not omnipotent. Um, uh, but I don't know everything, and, I've, and I lose track of some things. So, you know, if there's something you, need, you think you want to bring up, by all means, do it. Can't promise anything, but I can promise this. We will look at every comment. We will respond to every comment. So... Um, that I have to do to keep my job. So whatever you ask, uh, I will I will respond. So you know, I, I appreciate it if they're not like 40 pages long. I'll, no, I, whatever. Um, <laughs> the other area we did, the other thing that we looked at was um, allowing more flexibility for you to allow students to attend um, non-eligible institutions in your own country or overseas, right? So that, you know, because we have this problem where you have students who want to go to uh, maybe a university or college, uh, could be anywhere, in, I'll just use Europe because it's easy, in Europe, but it wasn't an eligible institution, so you couldn't execute any kind of a uh, agreement with that school, right? And we had all this thing about what if the student takes a couple credits there and you want to transfer them back and all this weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I think that we have liberalized that as well. Uh, pay, pay attention to that. Pay attention to the to the language on um, written arrangements. So I want to direct. I can't say much about it because I can't prejudice the negotiations and I can't prejudice the the the, uh, the the NPRM and the final that will come after it. But it is your opportunity. Certainly, I know I, I know Harrison will comment. I'm sure he will. <laughs> I don't think I have to guess at that. But but all of you should look as well and don't just rely upon uh, upon him or a few people. Um, if if you see something you want me to read uh, or those of us, not just me. Uh, go ahead and do it. Uh, I'll be anxious to see what you come up with uh, in response to our proposed rules. So when will these rules be out? Um, good question. Uh, our calendar, we had some rules we wanted to get out first. I can't make any guarantees, but I think that probably early, late winter, early spring, we would hope to get, we'd hope to get them out by then. So be looking, you know, February-ish, that time of year for when these proposals come out. You, you, I don't know what the comment period will be, but I'm guessing it won't be real long. So you want to make sure you read, get your comments in quickly. And uh, I'll be waiting with bated breath to see what you have to say. And I'll know it's you because the comment will be, has your name on it and everything, so. <laughs> I'll look at it and go, oh no, that one's, no, I won't that. so That's anything else you can think of, Cynthia? I think those are the big issues for that we have yeah, those are our big issues for this year. Now, I know there are a lot of things that weren't addressed in this package. I understand that. But, um, uh, you know, small gains here and there, right? Climbing the mountain slowly. So uh, getting to where we can get, trying to be a little more flexible uh, where we can be and uh, moving the ball in the right direction. At least I don't come here and have you guys yell at me for an hour the way you used to have to. But uh, so, you know, a couple of things there. I think we did some. Don't forget about the, about the uh, changes we made to um, um, consumer information. 
think we made a lot of good changes there, and a lot yeah. of that was really uh, some common sense <laughs> uh, things that needed to be done. You know, uh, and I personally feel that you should all have to do Constitution Day no matter where you are. But <laughs> other people disagree with me, and so therefore we had some uh, we we moved the we moved the needle a little bit, right? So uh, so bully for us there, right? So anyway, that's about all I have to opine about. Um, there you go. But again, the big thing is to, uh, I can't, I, so if, during this session, um, I can't take any comments. Like if you say, well, couldn't you do this or couldn't you have done that with those, that amendatory text? All I can tell you is the text is what the text is, comment. Uh, yeah, we can't take questions on it here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, can t I can take questions on explaining what is there, but nothing about, well, why didn't you do X or Y, you know. Uh, we did what we did, and uh, so I think now we can yeah, open it up. We can for open comments. it up if you have any comments or and questions. If some guys with microphones, will bring them around, and you can ask questions about anything you want. Or say, Greg, it just wasn't that good. No, don't don't say <laughs> that. Hi, I'm sure you know what I'm going to ask. We ask it every year. Any news on the Foreign Schools Order Guide? Yeah, uh, that should be real close, real close, because I reviewed it. Uh, it made me, they made me, and it's tedious to review those things, you know. Um, <laughs> but the, you think it's tedious. What do they think? Yeah, that's, but the IG did a great job running it, so <laughs> I, I don't, that has to be like, like within I don't know. A hair's days. breadth. Probably what's going Soon. on now is like the final review. I, I, I don't. Do you know anything about that, Byron? Well, there's a session on the audit guide tomorrow. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, so I would think, <clears throat> I'll just guess, they might not have done that if they didn't have something to say. So probably very really close. Yeah, so hold your questions for t tomorrow. I think it's, uh, I will say this, I did, I did review it and I was pretty impressed with the work they did. I think it's uh, certainly a much more useful document than what you have, yes. And on that audit guide, I know there's a session tomorrow, so from like a policy point of view, having read the presentation that we're probably going to be getting tomorrow, it seems like the audit guide will be coming in and implemented from the fiscal year just started. And I'm just wondering from a policy point of view how we can be expected to be audited on something that started back in September. And if there would be any major changes in terms of findings, um, we wouldn't be held too rigorously to those. So I think even though the audit guide is changing, I don't think like the actual policy is changing. So you probably, it, like the regulations haven't changed, the new guidance hasn't changed. So you're probably already doing what you should be doing. So it's not like they're gonna hold you to something totally different. It's just the way they're auditing it is gonna be different. Like what the auditors look at is different, but you guys are probably already doing what you're supposed to be doing because it's not really policy changes so much. Thanks, and just want to say thanks to Greg and to uh, Diane Jones for that regu regulatory uh, uh, change that he's talking about because they, they really made it happen uh, for with the uh, sensibility with the written arrangements. Um, and we're working on the distance education with Congress uh, uh, with with for IC. We, uh, as Greg said, IEC is going to comment on these regulations when they come out and. Uh, Anybody that wants to send in comments, that's great. But if you also want to make suggestions to me, and because we are going to send a comment, and we can combine it with something as well. Ooh, very romantic. Well, I, mean, I, I thought it was a good idea. Maybe not. But <laughs> <laughs> At least they didn't cut off the microphone. But uh, you know, we, we will be doing that as well, and, and it would be open. You know, it would find it really helpful. Any any ideas and things that that people do have and. And, and, um, and I'm just going to say one additional thing, which is not a Department of Education issue, but I have the mic, so hopefully it won't cut off. But we are talking to Congress about changing the Higher Education Act so we can fix the distance education problem. And one thing they're asking is for examples of problems that, you, that, that have 
directly affected students that have been hurt by these rules. They've lost their loans or are been forced to not do a class they need to do because it had a, a telecommunications component. Please send me uh, Harrison Wadsworth, go to the International Education Council website if you don't know my address or come up to me, I'll give you my card. Any, any of those examples you had, I'd really like to see those. So um, uh, please go ahead and, and send those uh, to me uh, if, you, if you can. And then finally, one thing that Greg did mention about uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, written arrangements rules is that uh, there's something called early implementation and uh, we are going to, in our comment, request early implementation. That means that they could take effect, the, 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 the regulations could take effect sooner. In other words, as soon as the final regulations are published, such as maybe sometime next summer, as opposed to having to wait a whole nother year until July 1st of 2021. So that's something we, that we will be requesting to hopefully speed that process up a little bit. So thank you. Thank you again. Thanks. Hi, just going back to audits, uh, we, we do invest a lot of time, energy and money uh, into doing our audits and um, we tend to receive an acknowledgement receipt but we don't always receive an audit determination letter. Um, I think it's been some years since we've received a, an audit determination letter. So can I ask, is no news good news or is something happening on the sidelines that might just mean you're not actually reviewing our audits? Yeah. No news is great news. <coughs> <laughs> if your audit has no findings, there's nothing there's for us to right. talk about, for example. Yeah, so, so what that basically means is that the auditor did not find anything wrong, and if there's no findings, you don't get an audit determination letter. So as Brian said, no news is great news. They may be so minor that we're not going to do anything about them. Right. They don't require resolution on, on our part, you know. Like usually, certainly, there's some, some findings you're always going to find. They go to resolution, like R2T4 findings would generally wind up with an audit resolution. So we, a resolution specialist at the department would resolve, would resolve the audit and send you a determination if there are any liabilities. So that would be an example of, of a finding that normally would involve that. But, but as Byron said, if it's minor findings, then it... It, it wouldn't require okay. the, the resolution so. process. Let's okay. see. Does Let me clarify my answer. Yes, I was going to just ask In a very that. federal way. Um, the foreign schools team will issue three letters. Either we got your audit, there's nothing in it, that this is done, thank you. Um, or we got your audit, there are some minor findings, you should not make sure they don't happen again, more or less, and this is finished. And the third one would be, we got your audit and we're gonna send you another letter that will address the findings in more detail. So if you are missing something, I would suggest that you email the foreign schools team. Thank you. So I have a question for y'all. How many of you frequently use the FSA handbook? A lot of hands, that's good. Um, so one of the things that I personally have been working on this past few months is putting the Foreign Schools Handbook, which as you know is in a PDF format, into a digital searchable yeah. format. Yeah. And <laughs> I am, so we're gonna do a focus group on Wednesday afternoon about this. And if one or two of you are interested in joining me for that, please come see me afterwards. I have a few slots left um, to talk more about what could be in terms of the FSA handbook. Like I said, we're, I really want to make it digital and searchable and, and look at what could be. And it occurred to me that I had not, it's an invite only event, and it occurred to me that I did not invite any foreign schools. So if a couple of you are interested in doing that, please see me afterwards, because I'd love to get y'all's input as well. And I think there was a question back in that corner. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering what the time delay in getting a letter of our, for our audit would be. So after three months, we're all good, or could it be up to six months? Finding about our audit that we submitted, say, in late October. Is there a general answer? Joe? <laughs> you could email the foreign schools team, but mm -hmm. I, 
The answer will be it depends. <laughs> What a lawyerly answer. Yes, <laughs> Hopefully you're using the email uh, account, and if you just email us, we could just pull it up and check it. Um, hopefully Easy Audit is coming. It's supposed to be on the way as well, and so hopefully you'll be able to upload. We have a session tomorrow on Easy Audit, so um, hopefully that'll come soon. So. Okay, so are there any non-audit related questions that we can answer for you? Because <laughs> that's really not my thing. <laughs> You explained everything so perfectly. That's right. We did such a no good questions. job this year that uh, I expect invitations from all of your homes to visit you in your <laughs> respective uh, countries. Hi, I have a question on borrower defense for the for-profit foreign schools. So I noticed in the NSLDS um, PowerPoint presentation they talked about a repayment rate that mm -hmm. they'll be generating for foreign for-profit schools. But then I thought I was looking in the new regs, and there's no repayment rate in it, in it. So I'm kind of confused about what the requirement is. So both of those statements are correct. So <laughs> what happened with bar defense <laughs> is that we had delayed the, the bar defense regulations, which were created in 2016 under the previous administration, um, were delayed for several years. And then back in, I want to say it was around March, um, the Department of Education lost a lawsuit, and we were required to put the regulations in effect more or less immediately. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of delay. And so the 2016 bar defense rules, which have a repayment rate, are currently in effect. We also have new regulations that were put out in, in the end of October, November 1st, I think, uh, that we're also on borrower defense, and you are correct. One of the things that it got rid of is the repayment rate requirement, as well as a bunch of other changes. Because we have this thing called the master calendar, we have to publish rules by November 1st. They go into effect the following July 1st of 2020. Although there are some things that we can early implement, they are things that you guys can early implement. They are not things that the Department of Education is allowed to early implement. So even if every single school decides to early implement the bar defense rules, the Department of Education is still bound to create that repayment rate, even though a lot of schools probably aren't gonna end up publishing it because by the time it gets created and then um, they early implement and so they end up not publishing it. But you know, who knows, there might be a school out there who really wants to show everybody what their repayment rate is and um, we are bound to create it and to do it. Got it. Thank you. Um, I don't know if this is something that would fall under everything you guys do, but it's I've seen anecdotally that a lot of universities outside the United States struggle with um, EdConnect and the IT implementation of that and having a firewall and their uh, secure university network and that kind of thing. I don't know if that's something that you have heard and I haven't, I don't know if we're not really talking I think much today or tomorrow about like EdConnect and EdExpress. Is that something that I guess you're aware of or is there much information to, to point universities towards support for that kind of thing? Um, that's something I've heard anecdotally but um yeah, I don't know. I don't know much to say about it other than I mean, we should definitely let the Ed Express folks know um, as we move into the new next gen digital platform. Maybe some of those issues will get relieved. Uh, just a quick follow up on the uh, negotiated rulemaking. Do you, there are some additional regulations, that, like particularly with regard to medical schools and so on that are regulatory as opposed to statutory. Is there a, uh, another negotiated rulemaking session coming up that might <laughs> offer some opportunity for commenting or addressing those issues? I, I don't think we, you know, I don't, uh, certainly not, I can say this, nothing's been announced about negotiated rulemaking. You know, I, I, there's always, internally, I guess, you know, things where people discuss 
uh, at the higher levels, you know, what might be on negotiated rulemaking if, if we were to do it again. Um, I, I couldn't say, and I really don't, you know, and I really don't know. It, it, uh, this is going to come as a huge shock to you, but at my level, uh, I, they don't necessarily share with me all of the uh, <laughs> all of the uh, ideas they have for negotiated rulemaking. I mean, this, so I don't know. I don't know when the next time we're going to do it is, or and when we do it, what will be on the agenda. It's a pretty big undertaking for us. It's expensive. Uh, it requires a lot of preliminary work. Uh, yeah, we, but you know, one of those things for the preliminary work, though, is we have what we call we have hearings yeah, where we so. go out. Usually there's one in D.C. and one or two out other places in the United States. And in those hearings, we hear from people what they want on the negotiated rulemaking agenda. So if we were to do another round of negotiated rulemaking, we follow that process. And in one of those hearings, if there are issues that, that you or anybody would like for us to uh, put on the next agenda, that would yeah. be the time to share those thoughts. And you know, nothing, nothing precludes you from, you know, I know, I know Diane fairly well. She's an open door policy. Nothing precludes your sending an email to Diane if you have ideas. Uh, she's always open to hearing. She's not going to promise anything, obviously, but she's always open to hearing from people. And uh, and I think sometimes she hears things that maybe she hadn't thought of. So uh, you know, if you have ideas, and the more specific you can be, I think the better. And uh, I think I don't think I'm overstepping my bounds by saying uh, you can certainly email her if you have any concerns about that, and she would definitely. Uh, respond. Thank you. Well, she definitely read your read email. Read your email. I'm yeah. not sure she'll respond, respond but she'll right definitely, right. She'll definitely, definitely read, read your email. email. <laughs> yeah, well, she's in, she is interested in, in in helping the community and hearing what you have to say. Hello. Um, this is in regards to university partnerships. Um, I'm with a London institution, and we are looking to partner with a U.S. institution, um, and we have a professional degree, um, and we've been working with them on um, kind of like a combined program where it's like a bachelor's and master's together, um, but the issue that we've had and the questions that we had was, you know, if our students, if we promote this program, this partnership, um, how will that affect FSA? Um, so we wanted to make sure we're, we're still unsure of how those, um, if we were in compliance with policies or anything like that, and if there's anything that we should be aware of. Um, there it's are very broad. I'm sorry. Yeah, there are definitely rules regarding that. You know, I mean, and, and there's, there's a bit of gray area there. What I would tell you to do is, um, rather than you know, because I would need to see that what your what what the um, the makeup of the program is. So you know, if you want to. Uh, uh, send that to me. Uh, let let me know how the program is structured, exactly how much time they'll spend at each location, and uh, if there's any kind of attenuation, you know, like uh, uh, completing a degree in one place or whatever, you know, how that's going to work. Uh, let me know about that, and I can certainly. I, it, it might take me a little bit of time and you know discussing with other people whether or not that would be eligible, but I certainly would. Um, I certainly would be able to, to tell you that. If you get it to me, um, I'm avail always available at gregory.martin at ed.gov. And uh, you might want to uh, copy the foreign schools team on that as well. Yeah. And uh, we will certainly, we, we talk a lot and we'll certainly discuss discuss the issue. And I'm, you know, I'm committed to being as um, open and flexible as I can be within the confines of what the regulations say. You know, the regulations are what they are, but, but I think where we can, um, where we can provide flexibility, where we can promote uh, innovation, uh, that's, that's something I want to do. So um, certainly send it to me, and I'd be glad to review it. And something like that, I think, you know, um, you want to have an individual answer for your individual situation. So do get it to me. Give me as much information as possible, and uh, we'll take a look. I think they all want to go to happy hour. Yeah, they probably do. I don't blame you. I, blame you. <laughs> I know I'm riveting, but uh, you know. anyway, uh, if you have, you know, if you think of other things that come up, uh, always feel free to email me or email Cynthia. Whatever we get, Absolutely. we usually discuss. And uh, as I said, we want to be as supportive as we can, uh, certainly for our American students going overseas. So 
thank you for coming and, and showing commitment to American students by being here. We really appreciate that. And uh, thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you.